Hello everybody and welcome to another uh, work group, Modern Astrology Planets Workshop for 2024. Today um, we are going to be working with Jupiter um, and we've just been uh, here in chat for the last half hour talking so we're in a good headspace for it right now. Um, you know what, I thought today uh, before we start, um, why don't we just sound off with some of the qualities, some of the keywords, some of the rulerships that we know about Jupiter. Let's get a, a list together and hello Gianna who's just logging in right now. Um, Hey, Gianna, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Your timing's flawless. We just started recording. So um, Michael and said you were going to be here today. And um, so uh, lovely to see you. Welcome. I'm so Good excited. Group. Thank you. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, so um, I thought today what we'd do, let's just sound off with some of the keywords, some of the rulerships, uh, some of the qualities of Jupiter that we know, just a, a, a brainstorm. Let me kick off with luck. Jupiter, oh, Jupiter rules luck. Expansion. Anything Jupiter it comes near it, it expands. It makes it bigger. Yes. Education. Husband. What was that? Husband. Sorry, Sandra. Optimistic. Yes, definitely. Optimism is a big part of Jupiter. Anything else? Higher education? Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Those ninth house qualities as well. Let's get some of those. Long distance travel? Yep. Expansive? Yep. Uh, religion or spirituality? That's right. Uh, and philosophy too, by extension, they all sort of, those three sort of make up a triumvirate between them. I think those are probably a lot of the big ones. Yeah. Uh, so we've got quite a spectrum. We've got everything from just dumb luck, um, all the way through to philosophy, you know what I mean? Uh, and spirituality, uh, long distance travel, all of that sort of stuff. So that's an incredible spectrum that's covered by one planet. And I, I get that it's the biggest planet, uh, in the solar system. So it's portfolio is going to be big by default. But that's quite a spectrum. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's a, a lot of different um, points. Um, everything from just letting the world happen the way that it um, is going to happen right through to um, God, philosophy and spirituality. Uh, and, um, you know, even the, the scientific mind, wisdom to a degree, that's all incorporated in there, too. So it's a very experiential planet. Uh, that seems to be probably one of the things that ties all of those different things all together. The more experience we have, the more meaningful all of those things become, you know. So um, maybe we'll come into it looking at it this way today. OK. Okay, session seven, Jupiter. Uh, we're going to look at the philosophy, uh, the mythology of um, this planet. Um, we're going to look at it from two different perspectives. We're going to look at Jupiter and we're going to look at Zeus. They're going to be um, the two um, deities that we're going to look at when we work with Jupiter today. We're going to look at Jupiter in the modern world. We'll look at the cards in the tarot deck that Jupiter rules uh, or influences. We'll look at the qualities of Jupiter in a sign. Uh, we'll look at the qualities of Jupiter in a house. And we'll also look at ways to work with Jupiter based on aspects, whether those aspects are easy or whether those aspects are hard. Uh, we'll take a, a glance at Jupiter retrograde, how that energy may express, how um, its own particular brand of haywire that it may bring to a chart. Uh, so we'll touch on that. And we'll finish the way that we always do by looking at the way that um, Jupiter, you know, we can manifest more um, Jupiter energy in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so that's the, the menu for today. That's what we're going to work with. All right, Jupiter and Zeus. Um, one of those things about the, the Romans was they were especially, especially good at uh, adapting uh, things from different cultures. Uh, anybody who knows anything about the Romans, the Romans had what they called Pax Romana. Uh, whenever they uh, invaded another country, whether it was by warfare, whether it was by negotiation, um, they introduced what they called Pax Romana, which is the law of the, the set of Roman laws uh, that guide the empire. And they would introduce those to the, um, the kingdom that they, they'd overtaken or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that became their laws. So there was a, a consistent law that was running right across the Roman Empire. And it's one of the most successful tools that they used to keep a degree of hegemony over their empire and keep everybody sort of on the same page and living the same way. 
if you could follow those rules, then you had all the privileges of a Roman citizen. Uh, if you could not follow those rules, then, you know, you fell into a slave caste or something like that, or, you know, you, maybe you were executed or whatever the case may be. One of the interesting things about Pax Romana is that you could worship any god that you wanted. The Romans really didn't care within reason, um, but you had to accept Caesar as a god as well. He had to become part of your pantheon. As long as you could do that, um, the Romans were pretty cool with whatever you, um, you know, system of worship that you had, as long as it didn't contradict their, you know, their own Pax Romana. And that explains why the Christians were particularly unsuccessful when um, but during their rise with the Roman Empire, because the Christians would not accept Caesar as a god. They were monotheistic. They only ever had one god, uh, one true god. And that clashed right up against um, the whole Roman ideology set. So that's what I asked them. The reason that I'm bringing this up is because Jupiter is the Roman uh, head of the Roman pantheon of gods, while Zeus is the head of the Greek pantheon of gods. Now, uh, Jupiter took on a lot of the qualities. And this is one of the, again, one of the things that um, the Romans were really, really good at. They were good at adapting and incorporating religion from other cultures, uh, technology from other cultures, culture from other cultures, all of that sort of stuff. They all incorporated it. And under Pax Romana, they set that as a kind of standard right across the empire. Um, but because of Pax Romana, you'll find that Jupiter reflects a lot of those qualities uh, of Pax Romana uh, that Zeus did not. Now, Jupiter was a statesman. Uh, Jupiter was concerned with, uh, with rules and laws and um, policies. And what we would look at as being a lot of those ninth house qualities, religion, uh, culture, um, with philosophy, all of those different things. Jupiter, they all fell under his, um, his, his purvey. He was a statesman and he was the head of an, almost like a CEO uh, of the Roman pantheon god, uh, of the Roman pantheon. So he had a lot of those qualities. Zeus, on the other hand, was a completely different creature altogether. So let's just break all of these down. And this will answer why, you know, at the beginning when we sounded off talking about a lot of the different rulerships that Jupiter had, why some of them, it seems like such a broad spectrum that, that he's covering uh, a lot of things because they, both of these gods together carry similar traits, but they have different qualities. Their base mentality is different. So if we're looking at Jupiter, uh, he ruled law, justice in the state, not in the way that... Um, uh, who's who famous, I think, uh, the Titaness, who he ended up marrying anyway, at one point, or no, ha having daughters with, um, he doesn't rule the, the rule of law, but he rules the concept of justice, uh, of law and the state and how those things are intertwined. He's the embodiment of Pax Romana. In that regard, he also rules authority and collective growth. So uh, the Roman Empire was an expansionist empire, and they're extremely successful at it. And that's incorporated un into his um, portfolio of skills and abilities. Uh, he ruled morality and prosperity. So there's our tie to philosophy, uh, morality, and ethics. Uh, for anybody who, who doesn't know the difference between the two, morality is something that uh, guides ourselves. Ethics is something that guides us socially as a group. Uh, and he ruled both of those. Uh, he ruled higher wisdom and faith. So we start to lean into the religious aspects, the um, why the ninth house also rules religion. It doesn't rule fundamental religion. It rules the concept of religion. You know, it rules uh, ceremony. It rules ritual. Uh, it rules uh, the, the nuts and bolts that bring um, a religion together, the philosophies that drive it, the ethics and the morality that bind it, all of those sort of things. He, he's not involved in the nitty gritty of it. And you'll find other ones uh, involved with that. Neptune more with the faith side of it. Uh, Mercury probably more with the charter side of it. You know what I mean? But he rules the overall overarching concept of religion and those moving parts that make something a religion. And he ruled material wealth. Uh, the Roman Empire was a wealthy empire. Um, very, very wealthy empire. And somehow they managed to just get the right balance of absolutely everything. And they managed to expand. In the end, like any great empire, probably the, what killed them was success. There's a, there's a horrible, horrible experiment that I think it was Harvard scientists did where they got um, something like a thousand mice and they put them all into one biome together. And they gave them absolutely everything they could ever want. Uh, they gave them all the food, all the comfort, everything that they needed. And over 
a period of time, they saw a decline, uh, a moral uh, and an ethical decline in the behaviours of the mice until eventually they annihilated themselves, uh, all of them. So and in a way, that's a, a microcosm example of what happened to the Roman Empire. The more successful, the more wealthy, the uh, more luxurious they became, the more indulgent they became, the more immoral they became, the more corrupt they became. Uh, and eventually the empire destroyed itself. Ironically, I think the last um, uh, Kaiser was um, uh, Constantine, who became a Christian. He converted to Christianity, uh, like a rat jumping from a sinking ship, I guess. Uh, but there's a whole story there too. And interestingly enough, there's a religious aspect to that tale, which just seems like a, a nail in the coffin for the Roman Empire. It just seems like the perfect, perfect keynote to, to finish there. So that's Jupiter. Now, when we look at Zeus, um, we, we're seeing a completely different animal altogether. Uh, Zeus was involved in human affairs and natural laws. Zeus was notorious for his string of love children all the way across the, the cosmos, the whole mythos of, um, you know, if they sat down and probably did a census, probably 10% of uh, everything in creation was somehow fathered by Zeus directly, you know. Um, so uh, he was terribly immoral in that regard. Uh, he was also concerned with natural laws, so he had no real interest in laws, justice, the state, all of that sort of stuff at all. In fact, um, it was quite the opposite. Uh, he was the embodiment of natural laws. Uh, these laws that, um, the law of the jungle, basically, the strong will prevail, uh, the law of chaos, uh, the law of destruction, you know what I mean? All of those, of, of chaos itself, of anarchy, uh, he was in, in, involved in all of that. Um, he was the god of pushing boundaries and in hubris, um, you know, where you uh, are so full of yourself uh, that you can't believe that, um, you know, uh, you can make a mistake or do anything wrong. Uh, that fell under his purvey. He was the ruler of experiential growth, and that's something that we touched on earlier. So learning through experience, um, through our labors, through our actions, uh, and, and the learning of Zeus came after the fact. We do what we do, uh, you know, um, drinks first, questions later. You know what I mean? And then um, at the end there, you sit there and you, um, you analyze based on how things went down. That's, that's how um, uh, Zeus taught. You know what I mean? We didn't go in there thinking. We didn't go in there um, with a plan. Uh, we just went in there, we um, hit the ground running and we did whatever we did. And then uh, we figured it out from there. So that, he was a completely different animal from that regard. Uh, he was about personal truth and higher knowledge. So while Jupiter was concerned with the laws and the growth of the state, uh, of the ethics and the morality of its citizens and all of these things, Zeus couldn't care less, could not care less. Uh, we're all here to, on having our own experience, our own way. Um, and, you know, um, come what may, that's, that's, that's what we're here to do. Uh, he ruled higher knowledge. And, you know, that's the thing about the ninth house, the difference between the third house and the ninth house. Third house, anybody, what you learn in the third house, anybody can teach you. You don't have to go far to get it. The ninth house, you need to leave your space. You need to leave your comfort zone. You need to go out into the world. You need to let go of all your security and, and everything that's touching, you know, that's that's protecting you uh, and open yourself up to, to new experiences that do not conform uh, to your model. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's where you learn. You, um, you learn that way. And, they, he, and Zeus ruled that. So that belongs to him. He also ruled fate and luck, which ties into his connection to natural laws. So um, when we sat, like I said, right at the beginning, when we sounded off and we talked about these qualities of Jupiter, it's amazing how contradictory some of these qualities are. But it's interesting in this regard that um, probably more than a lot of the other gods, uh, the astrological interpretation of Jupiter is an amalgam of both um, Zeus and Jupiter. And in a lot of ways, they're contradictory. They don't make sense, you know. Um, so, um, but they represent different ends of the spectrum. And I think this just sort of illustrates that. Do you know what I mean when we look at the individual rulership of these, these two different deities? Does anybody have any thoughts about this or any questions that they want to ask? Because I've just unpacked a lot there. We're good? Okay, Gianna, what you got? Um, I was reading some uh, history on the Roman Empire and I found it interesting that, um, and it just relates with Jupiter's spectrum, 
that um, the Romans actually um, were like, it was kind of like you did have personal freedom, but you just had to follow these like very loose law. I mean, you, they weren't loose, but they were, it was kind of like, we give you your freedom, but you must act um, in the best interest of the empire. And yeah. so I kind of yeah. equate that with like the ninth house as well. Like um, as long as you're contributing to society, like the, the growth of society, the wealth of society, the, spirituality of society like will kind of you, you'll kind of be left alone to like flourish yeah. but I don't know if I'm interpreting that wrong no you're absolutely right that was the very essence of Pax Romana uh, every country they went into they rolled that charter out and as long as they conformed with it they had all the privileges of Roman citizens whether they were in Rome whether they were in Britannia whether they were in Dalmatia uh, as long as they accepted that charter, then they had all of those privileges. The Romans would roll out all the technology with the bathhouses, the aqueducts, the medicine, all of that sort of stuff. They introduced it into all of these different countries. Um, you know, the interesting thing, and this is a thing about the ninth house, is you find this again and again in history. The biggest threat to most empires, to most societies, to most governments and things like that is always ideas. Um, so in a lot of ways, um, introducing hegemony that you know a, a single sort of um broad spectrum mindset for an empire uh, you know that ticks that box in a lot of ways that uh, makes sure that ideas are consistent uh, with the the mindset of the roman empire and things like that you see a lot of these um revolutions um and coups that happen around the world are started by intellectuals um so um it's in a way it's a soft form of control over ideas uh, and that by by understanding that early i think that was a, a really critical component and why they could spread as far as they did and last as long as they did that empire lasted a very very long time and again too like we saw you know um again talking about those that experiment with those mice um they the longer things were good the faster things got worse you know what i mean because people had all their needs met uh people didn't want for anything so they had all the time in the world to start plotting and turning on each other and um you know wanting more than um than their share they stopped concerning themselves with survival and they started thinking about power you know and lust uh and self-indulgence and all of those things and you know what every single one of those in a way is ruled by jupiter it's all a jupiter experience the roman empire it's one big experiment you know uh, unpacked and um set in motion uh, that lasted for i'm not sure how they, they were, the empire lasted for hundreds of years didn't it it was very very long uh, it was a very long empire um in terms of longevity so yeah cool thanks Gianna. Did anybody else have any other thoughts or questions they want to put out there? Yes, okay. I I just realized that when you when you say it's it's self destructive, it's like when we go too far indulging. Also, yeah. if you know, because um, Jupiter could be considered with excess. So if you eat too much, and they always say that if Jupiter is passing through the first house, you must be be careful. Yeah, you know because you will gain weight. So yeah, um, that's true. So, yeah, it, you know what, it goes to... further than that, too. When you think about it, I mean, I go to Southeast Asia, or, you know, quite often with my wife um, and things like peanut allergies and gluten intolerance and stuff. They don't have that there. You know, it's, it's just not there. Um, so uh, in a way, you know, that's part and part that uh, part and parcel of um, of uh, luxury that we enjoy. We're presented with all of these things. Uh, that eventually kill us. You know, heart disease is the big killer. Obesity is a big killer in our um, our societies and things like that too. They they don't affect other countries not the same way that they do in America and and um, you know the, the the first world and even the second world by extension. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. So yeah, you're so right. It's, it's Absolutely right. Sorry. With excess. Okay. Yes. Yes. I just just wanted to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing how even, I mean, we look at all of these qualities that we're presented with in this, um, you know, with Jupiter and Zeus, and in a way, it, every single one of these boxes is ticked. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does anybody else have any thoughts they want to add? Okay. 
the modern world. Okay, so Jupiter rules education and knowledge systems. Um, anything to do with education, uh, higher education especially, um, and things like that. Knowledge systems, learning systems, online learning, uh, different platforms, uh, different ways of learning, things like that too. That's all incorporated under Jupiter. Ethics and frameworks. Um, so frameworks that are adapted, for example, a code of ethics uh, or a mission statement that guides an organization and things like that. Um, all of these things, they all fall under Jupiter. You know, they introduce a philosophy, a mindset, a set of behavioral rules and things like that that we all follow. And this is our guiding principle. We can expand in any direction that we want from this. It's interesting. My wife's having this discussion right now. She's um, on a board for a not-for-profit and they just... Um, they're just um, at the stage now where they've secured funding and things like that. And they're uh, going out and looking for organizations and they're heading obstacles already. Um, their person that they want to go out and do um, the fundraising for them, the first company they went to is Rio Tinto, a mining company. And they're a, a company that's uh, working with renewable energy. So that's a tech straight away. They've already hit a boundary there immediately. And I think the biggest part of their board meeting last night was debating that whole topic out. How are we going to proceed from here, you know, and observe our code of ethics? So it's interesting, you know, the, the uh, frameworks that Jupiter puts down are not necessarily linear. They're not one path that we all follow. We can expand in any direction that we want, but we must follow these ethics if we're going to go in these directions. So um, Jupiter rules that. Travel and globalization, we know about that. That concept of globalization didn't, wasn't really a thing until the 1980s. I think that was the first time uh, there was a book called Megatrends that came out. Uh, and it's a really interesting read. It was like a, um, a prediction of how the next 20 or 30 years were going to go down. And I think they were the first to coin that phrase. Don't quote me. Um, but um, the, the 80s was um, when that phrase first came up. Interestingly, the phrase follow your dream first came up in the 80s too. You really didn't hear it much in the 70s or anything before that. So this whole thing now where everybody's an influencer and all of that sort of stuff, that's our fault. Uh, if you're a Generation X, we were taught to think that way and we've passed that on to another generation that's doing a better job of it in a more annoying way than we ever did. Um, so that also came up in the 80s too. And in a way, it, it feels like the same sort of thing. Space exploration, any form of exploration, but this is the final frontier now. You know what, it, and it's interesting when um, Trump started talking about, what was it Space Force? Um, you know, a force of soldiers who would be tasked with fighting in space and things like that. Chinese scrambling to do it now, everybody's eyes are on Mars, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, this expansionist mindset um, that um, comes with space exploration, it's all tied in with the energy of Jupiter. It's exploration, it's eminent domain, it's uh, territory, uh, it's colonization, uh, all of that sort of stuff. That's all part of um, the Jupiter rulership. Religion and spirituality, and we talked about that. Um, so, And it's not the nuts and bolts, it's not the finer details of a religion, it's not the, the nuances of religion, it's the overarching concept of religion. Uh, again, too, it, it's its components, it's the idea of how we approach a god, it's the rituals that we use, it's the ceremonies that we adopt, the colours that we wear, um, the, the um, rituals and the um, behaviours that we take on, all of these things, they all fall under Jupiter. Wealth, real estate, and investment. You know what? And in a way, this feels like uh, space, the way space exploration is going right now. Anybody who followed the, um, what was it, the um, global financial um, crisis, um, you know, that, that came about, my understanding is that came out about because of fractional lending. Banks were lending more money than they had. Um, they were, you know, giving out loans to people for homes when the, you know, and just saying, hey, you know, here's a loan for 100000 200000 250000 But if you went through and looked at their books and balanced them up with the amount of money that they were lending, they did not have that money to lend. They were just assuming that these, um, these people were going to um, come good on their debt. When an incredible amount of these debts went bad, uh, we had the global financial crisis. My feeling is the way things are going right now, where the banks have really doubled down and gone the complete opposite way, and it's become an investment market. They'd rather give money to people who already have houses than take the risk on people who don't have houses now. It's got everything to do with their own mistake that they made back uh, in the, the global financial crisis, the meltdown. You know what I mean? And now we've got um, probably a big percentage of homeowners are... Uh, 
own multiple homes, their investment properties and things like that, while we're seeing homelessness rising up uh, and increasing. We're seeing it eating into the middle class now. People who've got jobs, people have, you know, uh, and all of that sort of stuff and all of the things that were supposed to give you the keys to a life in a society now, they're not enough. You know, and these people are sleeping in their cars with their families or their vans and um, governments are making um, these generalized statements about how, you know, we're gonna turn this around, but it's gonna take 10 years. Uh, we've got a generation of kids growing up in cars and vans right now in tents. Um, and that's got everything to do with Jupiter. So, um, you know what, just because Jupiter rules um, uh, humor and goodwill and um, luck and all of that sort of stuff, it's not always necessarily beneficial for every single one of his constituents. So um, that's, a, you know, that's all falls under Jupiter as well. <laughs> Consumerism, that's definitely something that falls under Jupiter. And that's one of the most amazing things. It happened after World War II, the rise of industrialization. You know what, uh, they, uh, factories had to figure out how to send food to troops uh, in a way that were, wouldn't rot uh, or anything like that. So they started putting additives in it that weren't there before. Bread went from having three ingredients to having 27. Um, and, uh, you know, that's uh, that consumerism. That was the birth of consumerism. In the 50s, we had this generation who came back from the war uh, and they were ready, ready to start a, a new life, um, you know, after the devastation of World War II, buying houses for next to nothing, uh, buying properties, societies were forming up um, and all of these things. And people want, uh, were buying, 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 buying cars, buying houses, buying furniture, buying TV sets. Uh, all of that sort of stuff, and that's connected to Jupiter. That's a Jupiter experience. And finally, excessive financial optimism. We talked about that with the glo global financial crisis. Uh, but look, this goes right down to the um, goes right down the wire to the individual as well. You know what I mean? Uh, when you was thinking, you know what, I, I shouldn't buy that, but I'm gonna buy it because I, I know I can survive the next three weeks without food. Um, that's, you know what I mean? I'll figure out how to get to work uh, or, you know, whatever the case may be. Hey, you know, the, I'm sure the rent landlord won't mind if the rent is two weeks later, you know, than it is right now. Uh, we need to pay this. Excessive financial optimism uh, not only affects bankers and lending institutions, it, it, um, it affects right down the wire to the individual from the microcosm to the macrocosm. Uh, it's at the heart of every hardcore gambler. Uh, and that's uh, something that we see um, that belongs to Jupiter. It's, it's in that way, Jupiter doesn't directly rule gambling. Gambling is a symptom of excessive financial optimism. So uh, I think if you, you know, like when you use key words to look at a planet, in a way they're a bit of a blind, you know, okay, he rules philosophy and he rules um, gambling. You know what I mean? And you can sit there and try and get those two words to work against each other. You know, well, maybe somebody's philosophy is to gamble and things like that. It all sort of falls down into platitudes. But when you get down and you start to drill down and you start to ask yourself, what are the moving parts of those individual components? Then we start to understand the psychology of Jupiter and excessive financial optimism, excessive optimism in anything absolutely anything excessive optimism and love oh yeah she'll take me back or, you know uh, she, she won't find out about you know this affair or me spending the money or me selling the tv so that i can buy another head of crack uh, all of this sort of stuff you know what i mean um excessive financial optimism even that in itself doesn't quite grasp it but, but the words that come close to what it is it's somebody who buys a ticket to get to the destination but doesn't buy a ticket to come back because i'll figure it out when they get there um, you know what, and when you talk about these qualities, you're talking about Zeus. And when you're talking about Zeus, you're talking about Sagittarius. You know what I mean? Um, so in a, a lot of ways, um, Zeus and Sagittarius are probably more connected. And, and it's funny with Sagittarius because they're the kind of animal that uh, in the early part of their lives, they burn every bridge, they spend every dollar, they um, make enemies of every friend uh, and things like that. And they go out there and they won't listen to anybody. They go out and they gather all that experiential growth that Zeus is talking about. Uh, and then they come back and suddenly, miraculously, frustratingly, they seem wiser and smarter than everybody else. And they've got all these tools that they've built. Um, 
and they they come back and suddenly they're all involved in expansion and growth and you know these are the ethics and the rules we should be following and this is you know based on my experience we should be living this way and things like that and it's you know and you, when you knew them 10 years ago and just wanted to we were fully expecting them to wash up on a beach or um, be found in a car accident or something like that uh, or you're in a crack house somewhere down in um, you know downtown and things like that but suddenly they're the, the um, consultant for some Fortune 500 company, you know, you're thinking, what is wrong with the universe? Um, in a lot of ways, that's the transition from Zeus to Jupiter. Uh, and Sagittarius somehow miraculously, frustratingly often manages to make that journey in a lifetime. Um, so they're, they're not poles apart. Those gods are not necessarily exclusive of one another. You know, that in, in, in some ways they mark the beginning and the end of a journey. Um, and for Sagittarius, they probably, once they get to um, that Jupiter part, they again become, take the Zeus experience on. And they'll head out into new territory and they'll do everything from the beginning again, ignore all the good advice they get um, and, you know, um, not follow all the things that they learn from the first time round and come back with a whole new set of skills, you know. So uh, excessive financial optimism, uh, that's got a really broad spectrum when you apply it and when you talk about it. Anybody got any questions or thoughts or any uh, anecdotes or anything they want to add on to this? Go for it. Usain Bolt. <laughs> What's that? Uh, Usain Bolt always does the Sagittarius. Oh, yes. At yes. The Olympics. Yeah. And he's a yeah. long distance and short distance runner. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What do they say? You know, that your goal should always be outside your reach. Um, so right. that's a, such a Sagittarius thing, isn't it? You know, it should be beyond the reach of your fingertips. Uh, you should always be aiming further than you can go. Or otherwise, it's not a goal. You know, it's exactly. A chore. Yeah. yeah, it's a chore. Aim for the um, stars. And if you fall in the tree, it's still high. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, and it's funny with Neptune. Uh, in a lot of ways, we're talking about the same thing. But Neptune requires you to have faith in something bigger than yourself. Jupiter, it's all you, man. You know, you've got it. You've got this. You've got this. You know, it's optimistic. And, you know, even when you're in the worst time, Jupiter's like, eh, you know, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Just keep going, you know. Just keep going. You know, it's, a, it's this, an eternal <laughs> frustrating optimist. Um, you know, until it's not, until you don't hear that voice anymore and then you realise just how much shit you got yourself into. Um, you know, um, so that's, it, Jupiter is an eternal optimist for, 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 for better or for worse, you know. And at the end of the day, probably doesn't care about you that much. No, no, yeah. I think it's, 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 <laughs> it's a right. problem to have that excessive optimism because it yeah. does, it takes you away from reality. That's why we need yeah. Saturn next time. Ooh, that's yeah, gonna be yeah that's right. You know, every dumb thing you ever did, you know you shouldn't have done it, <laughs> you know, but you th either thought you were going to get away with it or you thought you were going to figure out, um, you know, you figure it out, you know, I'll be fine. And then you get caught and suddenly you've got legal problems or the bank's closing your account or someone's foreclosing on you or someone's saying, you know, you've got till Thursday to pay this or I'm going to send some guys around. Um, <laughs> it's all Jupiter. In God we trust. And that yeah, covers yeah. everything. Yeah, and but, then you miraculously, know, the money yeah. goes from who knows where. <laughs> Isn't it funny? And in a lot of ways, Jupiter's like Janus, you know, the two-faced god. He goes from being Jupiter to being Zeus, you know, like, what, man? You know, I don't care about you. You know, you go figure it out. You know, I've got bigger things to worry about, you know. So, um, <laughs> you got fish to fry. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything they want to guess, add or expand I on? guess it's the difference between whether your Jupiter is is well placed or well aspected or not because it can that the the example you gave earlier kind of feels like you know if your jupiter is is well aspected then that is your actual path is to you know take that sort of you know that excessive optimism and roll with it and don't let all of the rules and regulations all the shoulds that that life tells you you should be doing get in the way you just you actually have to take that higher path and then everything just falls into place for you and yeah. and you do come back and go ah oh, you know these are all the things you could experience in life if only you let go of of all the things that everyone tells you you should be doing um and so you do have that wisdom but obviously it's dependent on it being well aspected <laughs> you know what you're either a child of jupiter or a child of saturn um, 
children of Saturn, you know, look, I buy maybe one lotto ticket a year. I don't know why. For some stupid reason, I convince myself I'm going to win. You know, I can feel it. I'm, yeah. I'm already making plans about what <laughs> yeah. I'm going to spend the money on. So I go out and buy yeah. it and I lose catastrophically. I don't even get the $5 minimum price and things like this. And I'm like, oh, you dumbass. Why did you do that? You know, it always turns out like this. That's I'm a child of Saturn. You know, you remember how your mum yeah. told you uh, when you were a kid, you know, always put on clean underwear. Jupiter doesn't bother. Saturn changes it every day, every day, maybe yeah. twice, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So because um, who knows what will happen, you know, um, that's it. But it's going to be bad if it's Saturn. You know, something, what, I don't, you know, mark my words one day. You know, your mum's going to get a call from uh, the hospital, you know, ambulance driver. <laughs> hey, you know, he's been in a car accident. Uh, he's in really bad shape, but you'll be happy to know he was wearing clean underwear when it happened. So, um, <laughs> you know, um, that's you're either a child of Saturn or a child of Jupiter. Uh, I feel like probably when you get to this type of astrology that we do, where we're really trying to un untease, you know, very complicated patterns in our lives or, or things that have happened to us, a lot of us are children of Saturn. Uh, and we're beyond the rhetoric of, uh, you know, it'll be fine uh, because there's been enough of it not being fine in our lives for us to know we need to have a backup plan. Um, Jupiter's not good at that. So, um, mm. yeah, yeah. I kind of but feel like I'm, I'm half and half. I, I feel yep. <laughs> I, that I can definitely ride that, that higher stream and everything just falls into place. But yeah. when I then, when I let Saturn get involved, then that disrupts the whole flow of it and yeah. but you know you kind of feel like you need to so um yeah it's an interesting <laughs> juxtaposition <laughs> isn't it yeah yeah you know because that's the thing everybody keeps telling you about responsibility and stuff and you just somehow wonder you see these people who just they skate right across the surface of everything and maybe they just they did they just didn't learn that lesson i know nasa did this experiment um where they were trying to get the next generation of super minds back during the cold war uh, they wanted to find out what the components of genius were and at the end of the day it boiled down to really just not giving a shit what everybody else said and doing what you wanted to do they found that was strongest with children uh at at the earliest age they were geniuses they were if they because they didn't have any misconceptions or preconceptions they didn't have any doubts they just experimented they they were playing and they were figuring stuff out along the way when they went to school they noticed that the um the metric they were using for genius dropped dramatically until by the time they left high school, it was down to about 3%. Um, so structured thinking, uh, all of that sort of stuff annihilates luck, uh, annihilates that um, th those Jupiter qualities. Um, so you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's ironic because Jupiter rules education. So what are we doing? You know, uh, it's like you've got Jupiter made the school and then sat and turned up on Monday morning to teach the kids. It's just, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it makes no sense. So, um, well, because the, the original um, meaning of education was to raise up and to guide. It wasn't to, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. to give a set structure and not allow them to move outside yeah. of it, you know. So, so yeah, definitely education was Jupiter originally, but it definitely yeah. is Saturn now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still, we can't all be kids, can we? You know, uh, that's just the way it works. You know, some of us have got to um, have those Saturn qualities too. So it's all, I guess it's all about a balance, isn't it? You know, that's what mm. they say. I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> anybody else have any I, thoughts? I think, I think it sounds like a hell of a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah, it, does, it doesn't, it does, you know, we're throwing a bit of Neptune, maybe some Mars and Venus and you've got a party, haven't you? It's everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. No, nothing else? Okay. Okay. So the tarot deck, uh, Jupiter rules the Wheel of Fortune. Um, Antoinette, did you want to just give us a, a quick breakdown on how the Wheel of Fortune expresses in the tarot deck? Um, it speaks about cycles, cycles that are ending and new ones that are beginning. And it, to me, it speaks of expansion because I'm going to add Jupiter here. And it's like Jupiter for me is giving life meaning. You know, uh, what's your philosophy? And it also, from the from my point of view, is like there's things that are changing. It's destiny, so you're gonna have to decide if you're gonna just go along with it or you're gonna add some free will. That's basically how I see. It, but it's it's 
as long as it's a major arcana, yep. we don't have too much say in what's going on. The wheel is turning and you want to figure out if you're with the program or not. <laughs> yep. You know? So is that a <laughs> Zeus experience or a Jupiter experience? It's a Jupiter experience. Yeah, I don't I'm think about talking about I mean, those gods right from the beginning as well. Is it all about structure and the state and um, philosophies and um, things like that, or is it more about natural laws, about uh, luck, about um, chaos theory in a never, way? Yeah, I never, I never interpreted in that way about yeah. um, look, draw, look of the draw, or anything like that. That does okay. look like Russian roulette, though. Mm -hmm. I just think about expansion and elevation. I see yeah. it in like okay. from a soul level yep. that you're, you're a new portfolio. God said, you know what, we're done with that. Lessons learned. Now yep. we have a new set of lessons for you to learn. So um, yep. get out your pen and paper. We're going to be testing. You're going to be evaluated. And yep. certain further on the line, we get your evaluation. You get to test it. Yep. Okay. And okay. I, I, I had for me to read a card without context, just to yep. say you know, I just know that something big is going on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Does anybody else want to add to that? Okay. So the Wheel of Fortune card is ruled by Jupiter. <clears throat> Temperance. Ruled by Sagittarius. Which again, too, it's, 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 it's a really interesting... Um, What's the word? Juxtaposition in a lot of ways, too. When you talk about what's the essence of um, temperance? Anybody want to give us a, a, some uh, pointers on that? So it's talking about balance. If you if you look at the figure in the middle, she's got uh, or they or whoever it is, the, the figure has um, two two bowls, one in each hand, and it looks like, you know, there's water in each one, and it looks pretty balanced. Um, there's water, um, the figure standing on water, so that would that would uh, suggest that there's some emotion involved. Um, Sagittarius is a fire sign. That means that uh, there needs to be some action also, and then if you break down the numerology, you've got 10, you've got four, that's, that's 14, so that, is that 14, 10? I, I can hardly see it. Yeah, it's 14. Yeah, 14. So it breaks down to five. So um yeah, so you've got you've got five is a a little extra. So this card would suggest that there's extra, maybe um, you know, you've got more, an overabundance of something. And as long as you stay balanced, um, you know, you should be able to stay balanced and stay moving forward, uh, is what the Sagittarius symbol tells me. It's an action card uh, that yeah. just suggests balance, pretty much. Yeah. That's what I get from it. And isn't it an interesting that this is paired up with Sagittarius of all the signs? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, so it's a juxtaposition in itself um, that that's in there. And there's a wisdom about it. But it's funny. We were talking earlier about the journey of Sagittarius, you know, where they go through their excess, they go through their chaotic early years. It's funny, I see it in um, the astrology introduction course when people fill out that first assignment and they talk about their sun sign. Sagittarians, it's almost all, it's almost always, oh, you know, I, I didn't identify with any of the qualities that you put down in the keywords until I thought about the previous 30 years of my life. And then, yeah, I was all of those things, but I'm not now. You know, um, so um, and that's um, that's, uh, you know, that's an exaggerated version of a common story here from a lot of Sagittarians. When they come to this to this work, when they start getting interested in finding out the rules of how the universe operates, whether it's astrology, whether it's tarot or things like that, it's experiential. They've done it. They've been it. They've been there. They've come back, all of that sort of stuff. And now they're doing the audit. You know, they're trying to figure out how all those pieces went together and things like that. And in a way, the temperance card for me tells that story. You know what I mean? Um, at the early stage, Sagittarius and its full irresponsible glory, um, this card's not even an afterthought in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it's a destination, it's something you're striving towards. That's my own interpretation, I could be wrong. Um, so, you know, it describes that journey in a lot of ways. Okay. Uh, that's fire as wands, so uh, the four of wands. Does anybody want to tell us about that card? Oh, I says Jupiter, Jupiter in Aries. Yeah. Because oh, I use a different system. 
but okay. um, definitely would say a new journey. Yep. <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, it's like both of them are fire, and they both they go, both go well together. A new mm. philosophy, a new way of life, a new, you know, building a new foundation of um, a new a new school knowledge. Yeah. So many things. Starting. Yep. Starting over in a new country. <laughs> Can be. I've also seen it interpreted as um, the a, a respite on the step to a greater journey. So, I mean, uh, in the um, the image, there's uh, an adventurer, somebody who's been on an adventure and they're coming home and there's people waiting for them. Uh, but you can see that castle in the in the distance there as well. So, uh, and that's their goal. They're moving towards that castle. And so they're taking time to come home, touch base, replenish, refuel uh, in preparation for the next big push you know um like a hero's journey yeah yeah like a hero's journey so um mars goes on the journey <laughs> yeah yeah that's right but you know you've got the comfort of home you've got the warmth and love that you've been surrounded by as a child but that's not where your journey stops it's just there to replenish and to um reinvigorate you so you're ready to make that big push um yeah. for that next stage that new you know that castle is these maybe he's an empire builder maybe he's going to take somebody else's empire who knows you know <laughs> who knows who knows did, did anybody read that or see that story um i think it was the 70s it was a, a short story about two friends who had a bet one was a, a millionaire and the other one was a friend of his and the millionaire bet his friend that if he stayed in in one room for for, for 10 years uh, he'd give him a million dollars you know and the friend had, had accepted it so he put him in this room um gave him everything that he needed to live uh by about nine and a half years uh, into the deal, you know, because he never checked on his friend or anything like that. Nine and a half years, this millionaire had lost a whole lot of his money, couldn't pay the million if he wanted to. And so he figured, look, there's no way out of this. He was, he either kept his word or he killed this guy. So he gets himself a, a gun or a knife or whatever, goes into the room. There's nobody there except for a note that, and the guy says that in this room, he learned everything that he ever needed to learn about himself. And he realized at the end of the day, the best gift that he could have received was that it wasn't the million dollars. He, he had left two or three years earlier hadn't been in that wow. room wow so, the hermit yeah Nine yeah post. yeah yeah so in a way maybe the fourth house is like that uh sorry the um four of wands is, is similar to that as well that that journey and the room with the four walls right yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah comfort you know s security all of that sort of stuff but you know you yeah. it's not about surrendering yeah. to those comforts it's about just using that as a platform to launch yourself to a bigger goal absolutely yeah because four is like we like manifestation yeah 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 absolutely absolutely a good a good foundation to begin yeah that's right yeah for the next part you know we're not stopping the very there. beginning <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the uh, nine make... of cups anybody want to tell us about this card the nine suggests um like um a completion um and water of course uh gives the idea emotions once again that's what the cups are um yeah. and again he's you know with the balance and you've got pisces which would suggest piscean qualities obviously mm -hmm. and then jupiter um which would also suggest expansion uh mm -hmm. luck um optimism and it looks like he's surrounded again with everything that he needs and it looks like possibly he's because of all of his hard work you know jupiter um i guess that's the male it's hard to see but the the person in the image because of all of their hard work um they you know they're they're uh, what's the word i'm looking for they're, they're, they've got everything they need they've got plenty Fulfilled. and he definitely has plenty right Fulfilled. right yes Fulfilled. yes Fulfilled. In a way, it might be like that story I was just talking about, you know, the four of wands might be the deal, you know, uh, the friends providing him with the space and all of that. Uh, but when uh, and the friends thinking that in the, the distance there, that castle is the million dollars, he thinking, thinking that's what he's, he's preparing himself and gearing up for. But the nine of water might be where his friend is right now. Uh, at the end of the story, he might have found something bigger and finer and higher that fulfills him at a much deeper level uh, than that million dollars ever would have. Um, yeah Gianna. i also see this card as like a like a a death of maybe a, an ego death and a rebirth into 
like a presence that is very um, universal and like, so like kind of letting go of the material abundance and kind of stepping into a new rebirth of uh, more of like the spiritual and metaphysical abundance like, and, and, and like that new identity. Yeah, absolutely. The 12th yeah. house qualities of Pisces. Definitely. You know, everything melting uh, uh, in preparation for um, for rebirth, um, for reincarnation, for that next step, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of like with the four of fire, uh, you, you just mentioned the 12th house qualities of Pisces, but that four of fire would be the first house quality of Aries, which would be the beginning of the journey and setting out thinking that he wants the big mansion and the million dollars. And then by the time that he comes to the end of the journey, which is the nine, like you, like Jana pointed out with the, um, you know, the birth of, or um, the birth of a new personality. And, and he sees that he's come all the way around to Pisces and now he sees what's important and it's, it's, and he's got it all around him right there. So yeah, that's kind of what it means to me too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. Cool. All right. <clears throat> Jupiter and a sign. Jupiter is exponential. So we're talking about growth. Um, you know, um, there are other different, there are different types of growth. Exponential growth happens rapidly in every direction. Um, so when you connect Jupiter up to another planet, um, you have the potential for exponential growth. It also means that the dignity of the planet, the aspects that are attached to the planet say a lot about how that growth is going to happen. Um, whether we've got control over that growth, whether that growth is going to control us. The planet that it connects to gives us an idea of the essence of how that growth will happen. Uh, and the qualities of the planet that Jupiter is attached to will most likely grow in some way. Uh, they'll expand. They'll expand to a point that they may emerge as a philosophy, a mindset, a way of seeing the world, things like that, a belief system. And a lot of those belief systems are they're, they're not like Saturn where, you know, um, the, the more you feel Saturn's energy, the smaller your world seems to get. Uh, it seems to be that sort of optimism where, um, you know, the more that Jupiter does, the more you believe the world's got you back. Um, so if it's positively, positively aspected, uh, that's how it can express, you know, and it can go out and bleed into all the different parts of your life. Um, if Jupiter's a central planet hooked up to a whole bunch of different planets, then that can most certainly have that effect. And it can also create an expansionist sort of mindset too. But again, to remember, that's not always a good thing. Like we talked about like excessive financial um, optimism, things like that. Um, that's also another expression of that too. Just because we believe um, things are going to be great, you know, they, they aren't necessarily going to be great. I'm sure prisons full of people who believed exactly that they were going to nail it or, or, uh, or crush it, you know. <laughs> so um, Jupiter is exponential in the way that it expresses. <clears throat> Uh, rules, belief systems, and spirituality. So uh, what we're doing with our lives uh, experientially often emerges as um, our, our, our litmus test for um, new experiences and things like that too. Um, that's Jupiter working well, I think. And, uh, and it's different to the moon where we're drawing on um, sources within ourselves that quite often we can't even put our finger on where they come from. We just know if it feels right or wrong. Um, belief systems and spirituality under Jupiter, generally we do have a framework. We've had other experiences before that will tell us that, you know, we're getting hot or we're getting cold. Uh, we're on the right track or we're not. Uh, we've got enough to take another step or we don't, things like that. Wealth and prosperity, I think we all know that wherever Jupiter is on the chart. If it's well aspected, especially in the second house or uh, other things like that too, that can mean big things in terms of money. Um, and a lot of that, the time, maybe you don't even have to work for it. It'll, it'll come. It'll come. You know what I mean? Um, these people who talk about that the world's full of money, you know, um, Anna Delvey, that, um, who's, uh, what's in that, what was that series on Netflix, that fraudster who was ripping off, um, New York socialites and things like that. Um, she said that the world is it's full of money. It's, it's got a shortage of experience and skill. And that's how she positioned herself. And I hear she's on uh, the next Dancing of the Stars, so she's come back. Um, <laughs> these people never die, do they? That's the, how Jupiter is that. Um, <laughs> generosity and optimism. This is an interesting one too, because quite often uh, generosity, optimism, uh, and, um, and things like that too, 
we've got our own take on what that means. Some people are generous, but in the way that they they want to be. So they can be extremely mean in other areas. It can be a person who goes to church on a Sunday, puts a $50 note in the, the, the um, collection plate, then is an absolute bastard for the next six days of the week. Um, that can be a Jupiter thing. Uh, optimism at the same time too. Some people are, are optimistic. Uh, if they believe certain things line up, they look for, they create ideas in their head. You know, hey, if this happens, then I'll be lucky. And if that, you know, from a coin toss uh, point of view, um, that can be a form of optimism as well. You know, hey, if it comes up heads, then I'm going to go all, I'm going to go for it uh, and it's going to work. And if it doesn't, then it never was never meant to be, things like that too. There's different ways to interpret these words and they, they're intensely private and intensely subjective. When you're working with a client and you're looking at um, the way that this might be expressing, then it's really important to see the house, the, the planets, and then the other planets that are connected to it. Um, the houses that this planet rules and things like that. And it can give you an idea of the person's psychology when it comes to, to luck. And luck is a thing. You've got the Chinese empire who are thousands of years old, yet they acknowledge luck as a force that can be manipulated and used. You know what I mean? Uh, through um, feng shui and, uh, and through color and through ritual and all of that sort of stuff, you can increase luck. It's a force. Uh, Jupiter rules how far we will go, uh, whether it's chasing our dreams, whether it's pushing our luck, especially. Um, Jupiter rules that. That rules our internal thresholds. People who habitually take things too far, go too far, leave themselves stranded, um, burn bridges behind them, things like that, because they believe what's in front of them is going to be better. That old saying about how the grass is greener on the other side is, is a two-edged saying. And then when you ask people exactly uh, what that saying means, some people think it means that if you work hard, you can get to that other side with the green grasses. Other people, hey, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you go to the other side, that's not where the green grass is. You know, it, it never seems to be there. You've got to keep going forward and forward and forward uh, in order to do that. Um, I was listening to some comedian talk about uh, a floor, uh, a, a shopping centre where women can go and find the ideal man, uh, and it's a set of elevators that go up, and I think the um, it's like five stories. The first one, uh, the guy's got a job; he's basically clean, you know. Uh, and if if you settle with that, then you can get that, um, and you know he'll be your husband, and you can go home, and you know. And this woman takes the elevator, and she gets there, she's like, yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I'm curious to see what's on the next floor. She goes up and he's got the qualities of the first floor, but a whole set of new qualities. Maybe he's good with the kids, you know, or he's, he's um, affectionate or something like that. And she thinks, yeah, okay, I'm sure I can do better than this. And she goes up to the next floor, whole new set of skills. Um, by the fourth floor, she gets there and um, she uh, he's got absolutely everything. He's good looking, he's young, he's healthy, he's rich, uh, he's great with kids, he's loving, uh, he's thoughtful, all of that sort of stuff. She sits here and she thinks, yeah, okay, then I really need to see what's on the fifth floor. And she gets there and a mechanical voice says, you are visitor 346,967 and there's nothing there. So um, that's a Jupiter experience in a lot of ways. You keep thinking you can do better than what you've got. And then 10, 20 years later, you realize that you had everything that you needed to write back then. So how far we will go. And in a way, you've got to qualify that question if you're going to ask a client. It needs to be in context. You need to understand your client's motivations. They need to understand their motivations in order to really be able to answer that question. Uh, our relationship with luck. Some people push their luck and they're good at it. Some people, uh, my little sister is ridiculous. We can walk down the road when we were kids and she'd look over in a bush on the other side of the road and say, wait up, and then she'd run across here and pull a $5 note out of a patch of grass, you know, and stuff like that. It used to just drive me nuts. Um, me, I'm, again, like I said, a child of satin, you've got to work for everything. Got to, You know what I mean? And even when it comes, it tends to be smaller than the, what it looked like on the side of the box. Um, so... Our relationship with luck, uh, Jupiter's got a lot to do with that. And it's not just how the force of luck operates for us, it's how our mind uh, interprets uh, how available luck is to us. You know what I mean? Um, whether you've got all of those micro beliefs that get passed on to you, other people like, oh, yeah, no, there's no such thing as luck. You've got to work hard for everything in life and all of that sort of stuff. Um, like we were talking about with that NASA experience where they tried to find genius. Um, so a lot of it's got to do with our mindset surrounding luck as well. Ethics versus excess. 
And sometimes those two actually go together. It's ethics and excess. Um, but uh, uh, Jupiter rules ethics, our beliefs. And in many contexts, our beliefs are flexible, they're mutable, and they can be manipulated as well. I remember um, the first time I went to Melbourne, I was walking down a street and there were people all sleeping in sleeping bags um, on the side of the road um, and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of poverty in that city. Meanwhile, there's a Lamborghini drove right down the same road. You know what I mean? Um, and in a lot of ways, that's a statement about ethics. I guess what's acceptable in a society. I couldn't drive down that road in a Lamborghini. I'd be ashamed to. But that's just my own set of ethics. It's my own way of thinking and things like that too. Um, you can justify almost anything if you want to. Uh, and Jupiter is very, very amenable to that. Will will more than indulge you uh, if that's what you want to do. Excess. What's excessive for some is not excessive for others. You know, if you got raised in one of those families where you, if you're cutting an onion, you cut it right down to the stem and you take the minimum amount of skin off, or the other one where you just cut a little bit and throw the rest in the bin, or maybe you just don't ever cook for yourself. You know what I mean? You go out and you, you dine out every night. A lot of that's got to do with your relationship to, ex to excess. What's excessive for one person is not excessive for another, you know, uh, and Jupiter rules rules that not not the word but the spectrum the experience where you are it's a sliding scale it's not a, a one-off word if you saw excess in jupiter it doesn't mean you're excessive it just means we're going to talk about excess excess is something that um will fall under this this particular planet and it may manifest in this particular part of your chart jupiter shows on the chart where we are going to grow there will be growth generally in the area wherever Jupiter is. It's something that's going to happen in your life. It's somewhere where expansion uh, is going to happen. Um, so that's an important point in that regard. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts or anything they want to add on uh, Jupiter and a sign? Um, I would like to ask a question about when Jupiter is in uh, a sign of its fall. When it's in Gemini, it's in Gemini now. Yeah. How would you interpret that? Because Jupiter is going to expand any hole, unless yeah. it's besides Saturn. What are the qualities of Jupiter? We got it, 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 Jupiter's energy is exponential. Now, what happens when you put it in a sign like Gemini? It's tiny, or no? It, it's it worries about details because it's ruled it's, by Mercury. It, 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 let's simplify. Merc Mercury is uh, a Gemini. Uh, when we look at the rulership of Mercury, uh, whatever happens will happen quickly. It'll be mutable. It'll be super mutable. It'll be intellectual. It'll grow rapidly in any direction, probably outside our control. Um, Gemini, uh, a lot of the qualities of Gemini's, Gemini's that annoy you the most are, are rapid fire, uh, unpredictable. Um, you know what I mean? And they um, unreliable. Um, probably some of the best liars in my family, and we're a big family of Gemini's. Um, the, oh my God, they're awful. And they're so confident when they'll do it, they'll, they'll smile at you while they're, they're bullshitting. And you know they're lying. And they know they're lying. And they know that you know that they, they're lying. Oh my God, uh, it's but they do it anyway. They can't help themselves. You know what I mean? Anybody got one of those? <laughs> I'm, I'm Jupiter and Gemini, and I can't lie for it to save my life. Oh, you can't. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're, no. sitting right I, on I your can... son. We saw that. I can oh, yeah. I can tell a story and make a conv like I can I can I can create um what seems like a factual thing, you know, for the fun of it and tell it like it's completely real and people will believe me and uh, until I get to the end and say, yeah, no, that's not actually the story. True. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but if I'm actually trying to lie, I can't do it. It it shows on my face. I can't. It's it's impossible, <laughs> actually impossible for me to do. <laughs> yep. Oh, because Jupiter's the truth, right? The truth. Yeah, there you go. But Jupiter, it's but the the truth is flexible, isn't it? For real. Yeah. The, tr <laughs> the truth is subjective. Everyone has their own truth. Um, yeah, right. and, Gemini, and their, Gemini comes with a whole bag of truth. truth. You know what I mean? A whole What's shotgun that? full of truth. Um, that's Gemini you know, like bends the truth. Yeah, yeah, and you didn't even know it could bend that far. Um, they're that they're that that good, you know, when they want to be. Um, so that well, that may so, be a way so that Jupiter and Gemini might express, and it's 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 growth, and it may be growth that's coming at you so fast from so many different directions uh, that you don't know what the hell's going on. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, and it's happening maybe yeah. on a mental level. It could be happening on a on a, on a thought level. 
uh, and things like that too. So it could be somebody who cannot organize their thoughts or their thoughts are too big, uh, that they cannot process them uh, and they cannot make sense of them. And that's, you know, like when you look at medical astrology, um, Jupiter rules things like giganticism um, and elephantitis, things like that, where, and, and um, things where organs grow way bigger than they should, um, you know, and things like that. Um, so in a way, Jupiter and Gemini may be an expression of that on a mental level, how the mind's experiencing thought, uh, unable to organize, unable to control, you know, thoughts are just exploding and exploding. Uh, in every direction. It may be, in a way, it sounds like the very essence of ADHD, at least some of its forms. <laughs> yeah. It's like Elon Musk, because he's, he's got a, a great mind. Yeah, I don't know. I think he's, there's like a lot of thought, planets so. nobody knows about that he has on his chart. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Which begs the question, when you think about it, if we all got in a spaceship and moved to another galaxy and lived there, and there were new planets there and all of that sort of stuff, well, what does that do for us astrologers? You know, are we starting from the beginning? Maybe that's Elon Musk's chart. Maybe he's from another planet. Oh, God, um, one day we should look at it, eh? Yeah, yeah, well, that's the thing. And he might be using different planets to us, because um, there's some, there's some, <laughs> interesting, there's some <laughs> interesting stuff going on there. So Elon Musk is pretty cool. Yeah, he's very got interesting. A, he's, He's got a story too that um, involves a brother and the way his dad treated him growing up. So he's got, he's got kind of a sad story, and of course he's he's a little on the spectrum as well, y'all. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Right. I'm so right. he married. He still sleeps on the floor like he did when he was poor. You know, <laughs> she had enough of that, and she moved on. So um, I think he's simping on Taylor Swift at the moment. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> Keeps coming up on my feet for some reason. Um, but my wife uses my YouTube on the TV too, so I, I think I get the stuff that she's looking at. Um, <laughs> I know I'm not looking up Taylor Swift. Um, so, where, where we will grow, um, that's uh, a lot of Jupiter too. Does anybody else have any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Jupiter in a house. In many ways, this is going to be a re-emphasis of that, but... Identify the theme of the house, you know, so if it's the fourth house, it's going to happen in family. If it's the seventh house, it's relationships, partnerships, agreements, contracts, all that stuff. Look at the ruling sign of that house. Analyze Jupiter's role in that house, how uh, Jupiter's going to be bringing growth. What's going to exponentially happen in that house? Is the dignity good? Is the dignity confusing? Um, how's Jupiter going to play in that house? What's it going to do to that energy? The house and the sign that's ruling it. Synthesize the information, find a way to blend it together into something that's um, actionable, understandable, and relatable. You should be able to explain it to a client, or at least use it to form a question that's going to help you understand the way that your client is interpreting it for themselves. That's probably more it's important. It's interesting for, yeah. for the formulation of questions to, yeah. so that your interpretation gets where it's supposed to go. You're not just talking a whole pile of stuff. I think this is where a lot of astrologers get nervous, and, and this creates un. Uh, un necessary tension for yourself i think okay well i know with the planets in there and i know that house and the sign that it's in so i should be able to tell my client how that's operating and that's flawed that's wrong that's wrong you look at your own chart look you had to go to your own chart did, did you go to your own chart and look at that and just say yeah i'm 100 percent that i'm 100 percent that i'm 100 percent that of course not you know what i mean um if you're not 100 percent something then ask yourself why more often it's not that there's some more powerful planet or placement or aspect that seems to be sucking energy out of that or you know or getting the attention you know um that and drawing attention away from all of that sort of stuff they, you should be asking your clients questions not providing them with answers uh that that's my that's my belief in your questions are going to help you form um, well-informed and educated answers and when you've got that then when you start looking at the other pieces on the chart they start to fall into place because they explain behavior uh, that's why we tend to start with the big three because they at least are three big chunks um, that will help us form a picture but sometimes if you look at a chart and you see a whole lot of energy flowing to one stellium and one house and things like that you know that's where the action is um, maybe yeah. you're going to start there um, so, but look at it, get your own idea about how, okay, how are these all playing together? What's the house and the sign telling us, uh, what, what's strong in this placement? What's not strong in this placement? What's hanging out right on the edge of that stallion, but not quite as strong as all the other stuff. Uh, and what's probably dominating those other planets. What does a fusion of those planets look like? And then 
get an idea in your head and then ask your client a question based on that. You know, how do you experience so and so? Did something happen when you were a kid uh, in regard to uh, maybe a satin placement in there? Maybe when you were a child uh, in the third house, there was a mean teacher who picked on you. Yes, you know, because sometimes you you hear things, people look yeah. at your child, they'll tell you something and it sticks in your mind forever. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. You can't yeah. Get but it also over. too, from your client's point of view, if that happened when they were a kid and they were getting bullied by some nasty strict teacher, that sticks with you for a lifetime. You get all these un, unnecessary limitations you're putting on yourself that somebody else put in there. They don't belong to you. Um, so, you know what I mean? And that's definitely going to start impacting around the chart. And things like that too you know so when i that's why saturn is such a gift for astrologers often saturn and pluto if they're really strong on a chart uh, and they're in really critical placements they take a lot of the guesswork out of what your questions are going to be um so you know what i mean mind you if someone's just got this big fat jupiter in the middle of the, the um that's sitting in some spa bath right in the middle of their chart um that's just throwing good luck left right and center you know like uh, like this um then you know, you know, you, you've got to have an idea of where this chart's going. You know what I mean? So, uh, and how your client's going to receive you as well. Uh, if there's trigger energy, if that Mars looks like it's going to be volatile, then step lightly. But let's get there. I, I like to start there so I know how I can talk to my client and how they're experiencing, you know, what they're triggered by, what's um, where things are going. So, you know, you've got all these different points, but you should be starting with questions. Uh, again, too, this is, I like to have a couple of lead days before I um, meet a client. If a client wants a, a, a meeting on a Thursday, then I want the chart by a Tuesday. I want two days to sit with that chart and I want to sit there and I get an idea of where this is going, what sort of person I might be dealing with and where the best places are to start. You know, because I like to explore all the way these things are all going together and then find out what's catalytic in that pattern, what might be setting, might be the machine that's driving all of these working parts all around this. And let's get to that and find a best way to approach it. So, yeah, synthesize the information questions. And like I said, I, this, I think when I work with a lot of astrologers who know a lot of stuff, but they convince themselves they're supposed to know things before they talk to their client, just based on what's on the chart. You, you're leading yourself down a dangerous path if that's what you're doing, I think. And especially if you believe because that's there, because the chart says so, despite your client telling you, no, no, that's not what I'm experiencing, then I think you're, you're on a really dangerous path. You're not helping anybody. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for yeah. saying that, because I have felt so much pressure to know what it is that I'm going to say before the, before you get in there. And you don't really yeah. know. It could be a whole oh, any, it could be anything. You're just taking yeah. a, a guess. So, yeah. you know, and then you might you might go traumatize your client. You yeah. know, you have to be careful. And this well, about right. Mars and where too, they're gonna get triggered, it never occurs to me. So yeah, that's right. And remember that what, what might have triggered them in the early part of their life might not be triggering them now. The energy might have shifted on the chart from what you can see. Ask your client. Your client will tell you you ask the right questions. They'll open all the doors for your chart. They will open all your interpretive um, doorways. And the, the, you, you know what? When your client tells you something and you hear it and you sound back to them, yeah, okay, so I'm hearing you say this, you know, and and this and, and things like that. When they hear that, that builds confidence and that builds trust. Yeah, you're listening to me. You understand, you know. When you get right. two or three yes, steps on, yes. when when you get two or three steps on and a client says, oh, well, I, I do this and I do this. And you say, well, wait a second, you just told me that you know you do this and this you've also got ammunition to work with your client too you know and then the interesting thing is when you get moments like that problems and uh, conflicts internal conflicts that a, a client has had that they have not been able to understand start to emerge because what they're saying in one breath of absolute confidence what they're saying in another they don't match up so um you have to have a conversation you yeah. do you really do um i um I thought about um, doing readings, just um, somebody send a chart and um, just me look at the chart and just record it and send them a video. I can't do that. That's not my type of astrology. Mm. I would have no confidence in that. So I need to talk to my client. Right. I need to understand. Yeah. I, I, look, I'm not knocking that. anybody else who does that. And there are people who very successfully do it and they're good at it. And they're probably more intuitive readers. Uh, but when you're an Aquarius like me and Michael and you, you, you work on evidence and you work on facts, you work on feedback. Yeah, um, you're Aquarius as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm Aquarius too. Well, I mean, I've heard <laughs> that whatever sign you have in your fourth house is really what you really are at your heart. And I have Aquarius okay. in the fourth. So I yeah. feel more Aquarius sometimes. 
Yeah, you got to enjoy some queer. light. Yeah. <laughs> You're comfortable, guys. Really? Is your Scorpio rising? Uh, oh my God. Uh, well, I'm a 25 degree Libra rising. So, I'm, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for Scorpio rising. Anybody in here, Scorpio rising? <laughs> it's because I was just figuring it out. I said, oh my God, my child rule is the God of War and the God of the Underworld. And yeah. Death card is on the. Uh, you know, and then when, when I check the degree of, of my ascendant, it's that five of cups. So I said, oh, my God, I've come in here as, uh, you know, like with uh, bodyguards, these bodyguards over the chart and it's death and destruction. Just with the tarot, like I said, the tarot can take your natal chart to another level. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And I realized that that was the energy that I came in with. So yeah. I tried to find out was my birth traumatic or something, you know. Yeah. Anyway, and being having the eighth house on the first house is not easy. Yeah. People, you know. Yeah. Mm. Interesting astrology, very interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Hey there, Kristen. Kristen. Oh. Oh yeah. Sorry, I've been. <laughs> I, it's been a little chaos for me. So I've been like listening here and, and there. Um, but I thought it was interesting how you, you talked about how to break stuff down because I, you know, the way, one of the ways that I've been learning astrology, this is my, my second week in the midst of mm. the, the chaos of my actual life right now. Um, like I try to help people um, and they'll send their, they'll, they'll put their chart out there. And I'm like, I obviously I'm very basic. It's, you know, oh, okay, the chats pertaining to eighth house. Okay, look at your eighth house. And, you know, then it's like, okay, you've got this thing ruling your house. And then I'm like, um, you know, uh, who's the natural ruler of the house, right? Um, and then you find out the theme of the house. And pretty much for me, <laughs> well, for me, it stops there because I'm like, I don't know how to put it all together. I'm just sure. like, oh, I know this and I know that and I know this. Um, and then it's someone says, you know, we'll find the ruler. Like if it's eight house and eight house is ruled or it's Taurus. It's ruled by Venus. Well, where is your Venus located? Find your Venus. And then it's like your aspects and I get totally lost. But I get told like I was doing it wrong. And I'm like, I'm no expert. And I definitely don't claim to be an expert by far. But at least that's how I've learned to break it down so far yeah. <laughs> is who rules? What is the house theme? And who do you currently have in that house? And yeah, eventually I'll get to the point of how does it all work together? Because then there's like aspects and that's something to take into account too. And that's going to blow my mind off. But, um, you know, but it was interesting you say that because I've been told like, oh, you're doing it wrong. Like it's, you're, that's the 12, uh, not 12 step, but that's like the 12 alphabet thing. Like, you know, you have to consider both modern and traditional and I don't, I don't know. It was weird, but um, maybe you can share some thoughts on that because I have no idea. If you're reading for friends and family and things like that, I think it's, that's a great way to start. In fact, they're the best, um, best things you can do. Um, I think if you're still at an early stage you probably shouldn't be doing readings for um at least paid readings for other people for sure um, oh yeah like not getting paid <laughs> um, and I, I don't get the sense that you are uh, but even then no. i think you've got to be responsible with your information too so uh, yeah. look i uh, i'm a lot of people believe that ast astrology knowledge is the be all and end all um of being mm -hmm. a good astrologer i don't believe that i believe the ability to humanize uh and to uh to to make astrology be relatable, whether you're using your own experience, whether you're skilled at uh, communicating with other people and getting them to share theirs. I think that's a really powerful part of being who an astrologer is. I'd give that 50%. Uh, at the end of the day, we're into stellar ants on a ball of dirt, looking at these enormous objects moving around in space. For anybody to stand up and say with absolute authority, they understand how that works is bullshit, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But having said that, there are rules and there are, um, there are a set of principles that we all build our astrology on. And I think in order to be a, a, a decent astrology, you need to have your house in order in that regard. You need to know all of yeah. those things. Um, there's no, a I get, to, to know your own astrology. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it sounds like you're on that journey. Look, the, the thing is, it's funny, you go to an astrology convention, and it's the amount of the amount of intellectual and territorial pissing that goes on in these things is incredible. Um, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, and people are, it's very, very sectarian at the end of the day, too. And that's the funny thing. Now that we've got the digital age, and it's happening uh, in a different way to the way that it's always happened before, we don't see as much of that. Um, so you know what I mean? I think that's, um, I think at the end of the day, there's a level of knowledge you need to have, you need to have it, it's not negotiable, otherwise, you're just working with your yeah. own feelings. Um, and that's dangerous, mm -hmm. if you're working with the clients, but I think once you've got that knowledge, you should not disregard your own feelings, you should not disregard your own instincts, if you're an instinctive person, uh, or if mm -hmm. you're like me, you read using logic and um, evidence and um, communication and things like that, then you can rely on those things. Uh, and the more you use them, the better atom you'll get. Uh, the, the, it's, you yeah. Know, so, yeah. and I, and I usually tell people like, look, I've only been studying astrology for a week, man. So yeah. <laughs> this is all yeah. I know. Uh, yeah. Who rules the house? What does the house signify? And looking yeah. at your chart, you know, who is current, who rules the house in yours? And that is it. Yeah. And I say, I've done astrology sure. for two weeks. I know nothing else. Aspects play a role, and I have not even learned that. So I put that yeah. disclaimer every single time. <laughs> great, great. Well, they'll be growing with you. So um, that's that's really yeah. positive. All right. Yeah. Okay. So dignity and sign, house modality, we talked about that before. Um, so, you know, look at the dignity of the, again, see, like if you've got Jupiter and Gemini in the seventh house, you know, we already got an idea of that. Somebody who might promise the world to other people never delivers. You know what I mean? Makes agreements with people left, right and center. It might be a salesman who's really, really good at making the deal, but doesn't do the follow up, uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know what I mean? There's, we, we bring all of those things together um, when we look at the Jupiter in a house. We look at aspects to other planets that helps us to expand to see where influences are coming from. Sometimes what's happening in that planet may have begun with an aspect that runs off to the fourth house. It may have been something that's got its origins in the, in the home. It may be something up in the 10th house. Maybe somebody always knew they were going to be in that career. And I envy people who had that knowledge from an early age. I never had it. Um, so, um, and that aspects from those placements to this can tell us a lot about how the planet's expressing. Aspects from this planet to those other planets out there too, might tell them how they, um, you know, hey, I always knew I was going to believe that. And I always felt like I was, things were going to work out for me. It might be the Jupiter influence in the 10th house. You know, I always knew this career was going to go well. So um, explore it, do the detective work. Look at houses that Jupiter rules, like Kristen said. So we're um, looking at the, the ruler for that house. Uh, you know, that Jupiter rules around the chart as well to start building a bigger profile on how luck ethics, all of that sort of stuff uh, work. Remembering again that all of those words are subjective, like every planet on the chart. We experience the planets the way we experience them, not the way the rule book says that they work. Okay, sorry, just going back a step. Did anybody have any questions about um, anything on this or anything they wanted to add as well? We kind of breezed through that, but um, I think a lot of that is pretty straightforward. We should be doing that now. I don't have a question on this, but just a yep. comment that I would love to dive in further about at some point about the comment that um you're you're actually more who you are at your who you are at your core is more related potentially to your fourth house. Like I'm so fascinated by that. Um so yeah, just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, yeah, this is what you you are in the fourth house. Because it's your roots, it's where everything's the, the beginning and the end. And you're so you in commission. Your where mother, so like, yeah, okay. Right. And then God said, okay, now do your thing wherever the sun is. But basically, you come from this, this lineage, then away. Right. Okay. I, I got, I, heard, I learned that from my teacher. I have his picture <laughs> laminated. May you rest in peace, hon, but demon is taking over. <laughs> <laughs> I love oh, it so. <laughs> Thank okay. you. He, he, we learned a lot of those little tidbits in in class so i'm whenever i remember i'll share them with you it's really important okay. it is it's oh, true i feel it is true also great great well that okay. that makes it more 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 personal too you know if you you, you resonate with it 
uh, if you, other than just experiencing it um, in, on an intellectual level, you know, we can intellectualize anything at the end of the day. Gianna, just coming back, just, just briefly touching on that, one of the ways I look at the fourth house is not just family, but it's also looking at the in instinct, uh, uh, the Cancerian rulership of that sign. And a lot of um, our core beliefs that we struggle with for our lifetime might have been things that were given to us at an age where we were too young to know whether they were right for us or not. Uh, somebody might have told us something again and again. And my, my core belief, so once I grew up with a, um, um, you were horrible um, and oh, there was another one. God, if I can't remember it now, that's an, an amazing sign. Um, but um, there were two that I heard again and again and again when I was a kid. And I remember uh, they some, somebody I was with, I think it was a partner or someone noticed those words kept coming out when things got bad. Um, and you don't even think about them. You don't even process them. You just accept them as truth because they're embedded so deep in your psyche that your mind was not at a developed age where you could work out whether that was true or false for you or not. Um, so you mm -hmm. go out into life carrying those with you. Um, and it was interesting because this came up when we um, were working on Kristen's chart um, last week. When you, to work with these core beliefs, a lot of the time you can't intellectualize your way past them. You can't come up with a thought form. You've got to reverse engineer them. You've got to find a way to go back. Uh, and start to dismantle them at the roots so that everything else on top of them can grow. And Kristen's doing that work, which is amazing. It's really good feedback. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's my own personal take on that too. Family, uh, all of those other things, they're, they're, at the surface level, everything we see in the houses is all, um, it's all packaged in a way I think that anybody at any level um, can hear a story build, um, built from those building blocks and it will make sense to them on a personal level. But I think when you're working deeper and deeper with, with clients, uh, there are different interpretations for every single house. There are psychological interpretations for every house. There are spiritual interpretations for every house. Esoteric astrology has got its own full tool set on how those houses are interpreted. At the root and the core, they're all the, they all point in the same direction, but how we interpret them uh, is a completely different thing altogether. You know what I mean? I mean? Especially when you're talking about the fourth house and family, what, even just that question itself is loaded. How you ask every one of us here how we experience family as a, as a, as a child, it's all going to be different. It's all going to be different. Um, for some of us, it's something we don't even touch, uh, you know, um, and that's a commonality I see come up again and again in astrology, people who left home, people who never want anything to do with their family again, while other people who had everything that they ever needed was given to them by their family. Um, so we can't just say, yeah, this is your family. Um, and this was ruled by Jupiter. So your family's great and they're lucky and all of this sort of shit. Um, it, it, you've got to ask questions. You've got to dig deeper. Um, but if I was to answer your question, your particular question, I'd say for me, a lot of it's got is embedded in the subconscious stuff that was given to you before you were at an age where you were too young to process it and figure out, is this really right for me or is this not? Is this true or is this not? Uh, and you just take it and you um, build it into your personality and you, you continue to go forth. So I'm the only reason why I'm like super now focused on this because mm -hmm. also this obviously we're talking about Jupiter. Um for my fourth house is Sag and Sag is ruled by Jupiter and the fourth house is Cancer but Jupiter is conjunct my moon in Cancer in my 11th house. Okay. So I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I maybe said that a little too jumbled together but yeah, it's just very um, interesting how it's like now all connected. Mm. Okay. All right. Cool. You did, you did say once your 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 family is from a different culture or your parents. When we looked at your chat, we looked at that. I think. Um, they're Italian, and they. Um, no, I mean, I, we were all born here and raised, I was raised here, but I do feel like, yeah, I mean, my family has their own beliefs that are not associated with mine. And you moved around a lot, probably. Yeah, I moved around. I, my, on my own, moved around a lot. Yeah, I should have asked, you know. <laughs> Did you move around a lot? <laughs> Yes, on my own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, because I'm telling you, because my son has Jupiter's coming up to his IC and he's planning to move 
And I, I was like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's as above, so below. <laughs> it's true. So it does work out when you, you check it. Very interesting. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's get to the aspects. Okay. Jupiter conjunct another planet. Uh, as somebody with a growth mentality, more often than not, that's a really simplified way of looking at it. Somebody who may see opportunity easily connected to the planet that it's in, uh, that it's uh, conjunct, uh, the two of them fuse together. Uh, it's a big deal on the chart, whatever the planet is that Jupiter conjuncts. You know what I mean? Uh, for a lot of a, a lot of people that could be a go-to it could be a, a guaranteed source of luck on the chart something that always um you know uh, and it can be passion it can express this passion as well depending on what the planet is um if somebody uh had jupiter conjunct mars they might have an excessive drive so this this relentless energy to move forward and, and keep pushing or it might be somebody who's got an explosive tempo it could be somebody you know who's volatile to deal with and things like that but they've always managed to get what they want by being a bit of a bully or a lot of a bully you know what i mean uh, and it's always made their life work and, and made it easy uh, and jupiter remember too jupiter's the optimist jupiter you know if you're sitting there you're bullying somebody and they and you're getting dividends from it jupiter's there saying yeah man that's the way to do it yeah you you got him yeah you hold him down you know and all of this sort of stuff it'll it'll fuel whatever while somebody uh where jupiter's conjunct venus it may be somebody who who just loves that state of being in love and they seem to attract it and they seem to generate and emit this 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 aura of love about them as well. You know what I mean? I mean, these are really simplified examples. You'd need to see other aspects on the chart and things like that. But in a conjunction, the person just might have that magnetic, beautiful quality about that. And that inner voice from Jupiter might be saying the same thing to them too, you know, um, how lovable you are how um, valuable love is, how love is such an important part of life and all of that sort of stuff. There might be some ways that it might express uh, and it will grow and it will touch in a, on different areas of the chart and things like that. It's a central part of the person's mentality. It's a really powerful um, compadre to have to any uh, conjunction is when you throw Jupiter in that mix because it takes everything that it's touching and it turns it up, you know, and up and up. Um, so um, that's one way of looking at that. Jupiter sextile, uh, structured growth. You know, it's a person who who knows that when they do the work, they get the rewards, uh, and it never fails to pay off. People, uh, and you know, and it's a different way to Saturn because uh, you're getting dopamine um, from Jupiter, uh, while Saturn demands endorphins. You know, that's how Saturn pays. So you get paid at the end of the month by Saturn. Uh, Jupiter, you get paid every time you do something. You know, um, so it's um, it's paying a lot faster and, and uh, the rewards are there, you know, and you know that your work is heading somewhere and it's building something for you. And the best thing about it is the results seem to happen straight away or quickly. You know, you can feel the change that's happening around you and things like that. It's it's constantly, constantly happening around you. Jupiter trying. This is effortless growth. This is growth that happens all by itself. It's like somebody's got their own uh, fortune, you know, well of fortune or something like that, uh, that they can go to as many times as they want. And the best thing about it is, unlike Saturn, you're not afraid to do it. You know you can rely on it. It's going to be there uh, and it'll keep paying out. Um, so, you know what I mean? It's like an, an almost inexhaustible supply of good luck or good fortune or positivity or optimism or something like that. You know, and you meet these people who can go to the toughest that life can throw at a human being and they always seem to come out on top of it, humble and grateful uh, and, and things like that. And I, that's a word that hasn't actually come up today. I think your relationship with gratitude as well has also uh, got everything to do with Jupiter. Um, gratitude and Jupiter go together hand in hand. Um, so, um, and that can affect all of these words, you know, how grateful we are for what happens in our life. Some people, they have all the luck in the world, but the, in their mind, the, the good luck and the good fortune that comes their way, it never occurs to them to share it. You know what I mean? Um, so, um, and their relationship with Jupiter can determine that too. It can have a lot to do with that. Does anybody have anything to add to that or any questions they want to add, uh, ask? Uh, I do have a question. So if someone does struggle, <laughs> this is obviously me. <laughs> mm. um, if someone does struggle with um, like gratitude lists, you know, they talk about you like you're just talking about with, with gratitude. I struggle with um, gratitude lists that are beyond like necessities. 
Um, so I kind of wondered if because Jupiter is in my fourth house, it's ruled by Capricorn or because it's very much close to, I think it was Saturn. Ugh, pissed yeah. off at Saturn today. Um, uh, wondering if maybe that is why. Oh no, it's right next to Neptune. Uh -huh. uh, also not one of my favorites. Um, so I'm wondering if that could, those two being close to each other, if someone could struggle with gratitude lists of long shot. You're talking about a conjunction between Jupiter and um, Neptune. Yeah, maybe that's the reason why maybe somebody may struggle with uh, um, gratitude or finding the more optimism in things than pessimism. Neptune could definitely have a lot to do with that. Um, at the end of the day, Neptune's interesting in that it rules at the most basic level, it rules illusion, it, it, rule, it rules hidden things, uh, things that, for example, and that's why it rules faith. Uh, it also rules faith because faith by itself doesn't substantiate anything. I always look at the difference between faith and, and intelligence is intelligence is starting from the problem and working to the solution. Faith mm -hmm. is working from the solution back to the problem. So, and in, in, in a religious context, it could be st trusting in God first and that God will help guide you to find the answer to the problem. So you're starting somewhere out in the dark and then you're moving back into the light that way. So when you've attached it to something like Jupiter, um, then that luck in a way may feel like it's dependent on for forces external to yourself, or it may feel like uh, luck is something that's obscured, hidden by some sort of fog and that you've got to find it. Um, you know what I mean? Okay. It's not something that's readily available. Um, so uh, you've got to do the work in order to do it, or you've got to believe uh, and that's frustratingly difficult for earth signs and for air signs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know what I mean? We, we believe what earth signs believe what they can touch and um, air signs believe what they can substantiate. So faith is a really poor substitute um, for um, analytical, analytical thinking or for materialism. Uh, and that might be the struggle that you have. Um, so, I mean, that's one possible way of interpreting it. I mean, has yeah. anybody else got any thoughts on that? Okay, that might be that might be a way. I remember we we saw that placement on your chart and we talked about it. So um, you know, there's a lot of different ways, but um, you know, I think um, the ancient mariners, the ones who got on their their little wood ships and sailed off into the sunset, hoping to find the new world or the passage to India or something like that. A lot of that was Jupiter and a lot of that was Neptune. I think that really describes that placement. Uh, you know, the belief that we're going to find it, the belief that we've got the skill and the resources we need to crack this and all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, eventually people did, but the, the bottom of the ocean is littered with ships that had that same belief when they went out as well. Um, so, um, you know what I mean? I, I think it's, it's not something you can just substantiate at face value and that's frustrating for an earth sign, I think. So that may be why you have um, a problem with that placement and why luck may not come as easily to you. Um, you know what I mean? So, cause you're relying on some external source you can't control to provide it. Yeah. Anybody else got any other thoughts? Okay. Working with uh, hard aspects, Jupiter quincunx, uh, growth at the expense of something else. It can be uh, it can be growth, but it's adjusted growth. It's maybe growth that you have to keep putting energy into in order to get dividends from it. Um, you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily take care of itself. It can also be the opposite too. It can be some a situation where growth keeps happening and you need to keep culling it back in order to stop it affecting other parts of your life as well. Um, and that can be a really, really interesting uh, uh, in a conflict too. Sometimes it may be a part of your personality that contradicts that other part of your personality that wants to get its act together. It could be uh, as simple as, you know, Jupiter uh, in its full glory can be lazy. You know what I mean? And just sits here and waits for things to come back to them and things like that. And your Jupiter in a quincunx might be uh, directed at Saturn that wants to get a job done and wants to build a career and stuff. But there's always this inner temptation to, to just sit on your ass and watch Netflix. Uh, you know what I mean? So you're having to, to balance it out. But it can be more than that as well. It can be uh, a, a self-sabotaging belief that keeps growing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It keeps expanding and, and touching other parts of your life. It could be just as simple as negativity. Uh, and things like that. 
um, and it's manifesting through this quincunx. So it can go two ways. One, uh, it can be growth that you have to keep, keep, you know, uh, like the old, um, what do you call them, the old sewing machines where you had to keep pushing the pedal uh, with your foot all the time to, to, to be able to put a shirt together and stuff like that. And that was your job all day. You know, your right leg was five times bigger than your left leg. Um, that could be like that, uh, or it could be the opposite, where you've got some other part of your life that just keeps coming up again and again and again, no matter how much you cull it, uh, and it, you know, it's problematic. Uh, for other people with that um, Neptune-Jupiter placement, it could be an addiction, an addiction that keeps presenting itself. Um, when you're not looking at it, it keeps coming back again and again and again, uh, and there's different types of addictions. So, um, you know, the urge for it just keeps getting stronger. Some people, it could be, it, 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 with Saturn, it could be somebody who um, grows and grows and grows and then suddenly the negative self-belief comes in, no, I'm not good enough for this. And incidentally, are you all familiar with the, the grand conjunction? Placement happens, I think it's every 40 years. Um, it's Saturn and Jupiter conjunct. Um, it's called the great, the, great, uh, the grand conjunction or the great conjunction. Uh, it's a power placement. If somebody's got it on a chart, uh, generally it's somebody who will do the work and they will get the rewards for it. Many, many powerful people in history have had that placement. Also, uh, when it happens, uh, for the at least for the first, God knows how many times, uh, when it happened in the history of American presidents, American presidents were assassinated when the Grand Conjunction came around. It was called Tecumseh's Curse. Um, I think the last time it really super applied was when it happened to Reagan and Reagan survived it. Interestingly, the Grand Conjunction happened when Trump went into office and somebody just took a shot at him a while ago. Um, so it just seems to be whatever it started out as a 100% kill rate's just kind of dwindled off and gotten wider and wider as time's gone on. Um, but Saturn and Jupiter together can actually be one of the most powerful placements there is. It's a Grand conjun Conjunction. Um, I think Dick Cheney's got it. Um, and other people like him, especially it's got a real love affair with American politics, that placement. So, yeah. Jupiter square. Um, this can actually manifest with recklessness. Uh, you know what I mean? We were talking about those Zeus qualities before of just throw caution to the wind and push forward. A Jupiter square can actually do that, uh, have that impact on the chart. Uh, a person whose uh, Jupiter is conjunct something else it, uh, can express as somebody who's irresponsible, reckless, take unnecessary risks and things like that too. It can also be somebody who's uh, who has to has to do hard work in order to get any sort of um, good things in their lives as well. It could just be um, something, if they do the work, you know, the rock moves a little bit and then they manage to drip feed themselves a little bit more to keep going and things like that. But luck is on tap uh, and not in the good way, not like in a bar where you can just go in with a, an endless tab. It's, you know, when you're going there and going through your pennies um, just to get a drink. So um, those are two different ways, that it, two of the different ways that it can express. But interestingly, recklessness is something that seems to come up again and again with the Jupiter square. And Jupiter in opposition to uh, another planet, uh, ethical dilemmas. Uh, you know, and again, too, for most oppositions, this is how it expresses as well. But it's particularly interesting in Jupiter because it becomes uh, ethics are involved. You know what I mean? Um, and ethics, again, too, um, ethics or morals, it can be both. Even your own morality may oppose uh, the norms, may oppose the, the stereotype of uh, what's right for an industry or right for a group or a society and things like that. But that belief system in yourself may conflict um, with what's happening with another planet as well. So um, that's ethical dilemmas. Uh, Religious or spiritual dilemmas, uh, they can emerge the same way as well, too. Um, and you know what I mean? Uh, you may feel that, again, looking at those Zeus qualities, Jupiter may represent your understanding of the way natural laws work, the way the universe works, uh, and the bigger universe around you. And that may be in conflict with what, you, uh, with what another planet on your chart is trying to do. Uh, and that can be especially interesting if that other planet is particularly powerful. I can manifest as anything from guilt um, right through to to a mental breakdown or something like that. And we're unable to, you've got a cognitive dissonance and you're unable to reconcile those two uh, different things. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any uh, thoughts or questions or um, feedback on um, Jupiter and, and negative placements to other planets? Uh, 
Okay. Cool. I, I read a few days ago that Jupiter in a negative um is not really when it's in a difficult aspect, it's not really that difficult, but it, it gives the excess that creates the difficulty. So it makes a lot of sense with what you're saying at the beginning. Yeah, sometimes it's just too much of what you don't want. Right. Sometimes it's too much of what you do want, and that can be just as much a problem too. Um, you know what I mean? When you um, want to get your act together, you know, it, it's probably at the heart of that person who knows they could be could could be great if they really really tried, um, but they don't try. You know, uh, that Jupiter, they're happy with what they've got until they see what other people have got, or they sit there at three o'clock in the morning. You know, the hour of the wolf. Um, and um, think, you know, man, if I'd, if I'd started 20 years ago, I'd probably be a millionaire right now. I can see it, you know. Somebody else goes out and does something connected to an idea you had back in the 1980s and uh, Elon Musk now, you know. Um, <laughs> it could be, you know, that could be it. Um, so sometimes it's too much of what you don't want. Sometimes it's too much of what you, what you do want. The one commonality is you can't control it. Yeah, because once I saw in a chart also Jupiter opposite Neptune, yeah. and it was a, a diff, somebody who had problems with drinking. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I never used no to, I used to think the same way. I used to think even, you know, okay, so I'm too lucky. How bad can that be? Um, but then when I did studied medical astrology and saw that it was connected to elephantitis, you know what I mean? Uh, or um, what's the... Um, cirrhosis of the liver is that the one where it, it, it just expands and grows and gets too big i can't remember what the medical term is and things like that uh oh, or your heart expanding and things like that things that are bigger than they need to be and they can become life-threatening things like that that threw a whole different oh, really? on it for me you know what i mean so especially uh jupiter and leo for example yeah 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 all the sun you know um jupiter and the sun together those are interesting aspects jupiter with the sun yeah yeah. I also read once that Jupiter square sun is like a God complex or Could Messiah be. complex or something yeah. like that. Because Jupiter is considered God in the natal chart and Saturn is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about good and bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, there's your great conjunction again, too, you know. Um, but then you've got the full spectrum, you know, um, when Jupiter and the sun, there's uh, so many different ways that can express, too. But whatever they are, they're yeah. going to be big. They're going to be big, you know. So, yeah, because it's your identity. So what? What? Yeah. It can't be that bad because you like you have a connection to to something divine. Yeah, but you it's know? the same thing too. Again, too, he, Jupiter's an optimist, but just because he's an optimist doesn't mean he's going to do you any good. You know what I mean? And this is probably my Saturn talking, but you know, um, you get t too much of anything. You know what I mean? And Jupiter's going to be there saying, "Yeah, yeah, no, we're we're good, we're fine. You, you you've got this." You know what I mean? It's always going to be an optimist, but the optimists. You know, how many times have you done something risky in your life? You've been surrounded by optimists telling you, yeah, man, you're doing the right thing and all this. And it's just been all bad advice. You should have really listened to yourself or just used your brain a little more than you did. So, um, yeah, optimism. Yeah, I, I don't want to be the bastard who says optimism is not a good thing. Um, but it's not always the best thing for you, you know. So, it's true. You're so right. Yeah. It's a turn. <laughs> I, think, I think if you're the optimist, and you're following your own advice, then yeah. it's plain sailing. Sure. <laughs> if you're the optimist, and and if you're not the optimist, and you're following somebody else's advice who is an optimist, then it's not because it's not your thing. So it's like coming back to you. <laughs> it is, isn't it? And it's really good. It says so much about your relationship to yourself. Having an optimist around you all the time, somebody who doesn't matter whether it's bad or worse, uh, you know, or good or whatever, but they're always optimistic and they're always sending you positivity, can change your life as well. Um, so mm. it's a it's a complicated relationship. If you don't have your own optimism to rely on, your own Jupiter on, you know, to that you're tapped into like an IV, um, then somebody else's it can be a, a dangerous relationship. Uh, but it can be an incredible yeah. one, you know. And then there's luck, you know, all on the um, straight up there. It's just the summation of luck, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Jupiter retrograde. Just quickly, some of the ways this might express. Uh, if we look at uh, natal Jupiter retrograde on our chart, uh, it can be introspective growth, growth that's happening on the inside. Maybe the rest of the world won't see it. Um, but, you know, there is growth happening. Uh, it is happening inside you. Uh, it, can, it can be positive. It can be negative growth, you know, but there is expansion that's happening within you. It's just the rest of the world's not necessarily seeing it. 
And as we talked about before, it can also be unexpected and unwanted growth. Things, uh, thought forms in you that keep growing, emotions that just seem to, it could be at the root of anxiety, for example. It could be something inside you that just wells up and wells up and you can't control it uh, until it overwhelms you and you've got to find your way uh, how to alleviate all that internal pressure. Uh, it can test our beliefs. Um, so having Jupiter retrograde inside, we may have our own beliefs. We may have beliefs that were given to each other and it may feel like life's constantly testing those beliefs and checking to see whether they're real or not, whether they're just pipe dreams or if they're actually real. Um, you know, and this could be somebody who's got a really tough um, Jupiter placement on their chart too. You know, where um, life's challenging them to continually get real about what is who they are and, and what they're about, you know, and, and to, to build that core for themselves. Uh, it can represent a scaling back, um, whether you are initiating it yourself or whether life seems to be initiating it. It could be negative growth, a negative growth pattern within yourself, something that seems to keep diminishing, that you need to keep growing and doing the work, like that quincunx placement. Um, or it could be something, again, too, that's growing inside a person that you need to work on. And, and again, the example might be anxiety, person who you can manage their own anxiety and keep their own levels down. A person may be unconventionally expressive. They may express themselves in ways that other people don't expect or don't make sense to other people. Uh, or they may express themselves with an emotion that doesn't seem to be the appropriate emotion for expressing uh, in a situation like that too. A person who, who laughs when you're watching horror movies, for example, and I know I'm guilty of that. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, a person who, who cries uh, easily um, and, and things like that. You know what I mean? Um, it could... Be something that that is connected to a Jupiter placement too, and I'd suspect the Moon would be in there, or Cancer, or something like that too. And it may be a person who's just forced to make their own luck. You know, uh, you've got this retrograde Jupiter. They know luck's in there somewhere, but it's not a force that's just going to keep pushing them along. They need to make their own luck. And you, some people use that as a catchphrase. Uh, I believe in that. And again, too, it's probably the Saturn thing. Um, but luck can be made, it can be created, created, you can create conditions where luck is more likely to happen. Uh, you know, even just by simplifying or reducing variables, you can increase luck too. Does anybody have uh, Jupiter retrograde on their chart? Okay, cool. Oh, Mercury, gosh, there's a typo. Uh, manifesting Jupiter, um, let's have a look. Thursday, as Antoinette pointed out right at the beginning, um, Thursday is today, uh, if you're in Australia, is um, the day for Jupiter. So if you want to work on building more Jupiter energy into your life, Thursday's a growth day, um, so it's good from, in that regard. So um, keep your um, diary full of things that require growth on a Thursday. Uh, we talked about, every time we talk about this, we talk about having a shrine or an altar uh, for something, you know, and you have one shrine or altar if you want to work with different planets during the week, you know, then fall back on, make yourself a little sacred space and do it that way. Uh, royal, blue, purple, and gold, they are the colours of Jupiter. Gratitude, actually, there is that word. Uh, expressing gratitude, thinking about things you're grateful for um, in, in your life and things like that. That's an excellent way to connect with Jupiter energy uh, and acknowledging that, you know, the energy of Jupiter at work in your own life. It's just think about gratitude, things you're grateful for, people you're grateful for, situations you're grateful for, uh, and all of that sort of stuff that falls under that. Now, if you're looking for things to put on your altar, uh, books, money, and travel gear, they're excellent things to put on there, whether it's a carabiner, uh, for mountain climbing, whether it's a, an old plane ticket to a place that you want to go to again, um, whether it's a book on something that you, uh, you see these um, YouTube videos of Chinese children preparing for exams and they'll have the study book there and they're there just trying to get the vibes off the book, you know, and incorporate them that way. And they're normally crying too when they do it. So you can see they've, they've waited too long to do their study. Um, that could be a way to, to try and do that. And of course, if you want more money, you know, then put some money on your altar on a Thursday. That might um, increase the flow of money into your life. You're, you're welcoming it. You're inviting more money into your life. Uh, yellow sapphire and turquoise are two very powerful stones for um, attracting uh, Jupiter energy into your life. Uh, they uh, have a strong connection to expansion, especially uh, yellow sapphire uh, and luck. 
Um, so they're very strong. And the color turquoise too. Uh, you add that to royal blue, purple, and gold. And the flowers uh, are lilies, carnations, and dandelions. Uh, if you um, want to put some flowers on your altar, then they are three very excellent ones that you can put on there. That will help set a mood um, for Jupiter energy. Cool. And that's us. That's everybody. That's Jupiter. We've covered a lot today. Man, how long was that? That was a very long session. Um, but it just yeah. the time seems to fly when we do this. So um, thank you to everybody, especially to those who turned up before uh, a little early as well. We had uh, a lot of laughs at the beginning. Yes, and Jupiter's yeah. going to be <laughs> I think that made this a lot. time, yeah. longer time. It's yeah, yeah, that's right. They put it in the right headspace for this. It was really, really good. great. So thank you, Antoinette. Thank well, you. We had fun Andrew, at the beginning. Michael and Lord have yeah, mercy. We had a, little, <laughs> can we had I, a pre party. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Um, with regards to the manifesting Jupiter, um, yeah. if your Jupiter is not in a, a great aspect um, on your chart, and it would doing these things actually be more supportive or would it expand <laughs> its detrimental um, <laughs> capabilities, do you think? You know, I think um, I think more than anybody, you should probably be doing something like that. If you've got a great Jupiter placement in chart, why would you even bother? I mean, that thing's paying dividends anyway. I agree. You know yes. what I mean? Do we tell you where, man? Yeah, well, you know, hey, well, no, see, but... that's what I'm saying. Your relationship with um, with excess and things like that, too. You know, you've got to check that. Um, so, <laughs> you know, uh, but what I'm saying is even if it's a tough placement, what a shrine or an altar is, in my mind, is uh, you're directing and creating energy in your mind. You're creating thought forms. You're focusing energy. You know what I mean? And you're saying, I want luck. Yeah. I want money. I want growth and things. Uh, it, it, from an external source in a way that you're not necessarily getting it right now. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? So that's the thing. You're tapping, in, into, you're tapping yeah. into Jupiter's pure energy as opposed to how Jupiter's yeah. presenting on your chart. Yeah, but you're also rewiring your brain while you're doing it too. You're creating a thought yeah. form, you're focusing, and, and uh, you uh, you may be undoing some, some negative um, thought forms that you have already, you know, based on a tough Jupiter placement yeah. and things like that. And you're, you're creating new neural pathways for yourself. Yeah. yeah, that's my that's my feeling. That's my feeling. You know, mm -hmm. otherwise you're just succumbing to the power of a Jupiter you've got no control over. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Does anybody else have any thoughts? We um, we went through a lot today. Anybody have anything they want to add or anything they want to discuss or anything they want to just throw out there to to cap it off? I have a quick question. Okay. Um, how would you read okay, the Jupiter's in the twelfth house, and but the ascendant rules the first house, and it's this, the both Aquarius. How would you re read that? You know what? Um, to start, uh, if I was to work with that, and maybe Chris, uh, maybe Rowan, you might want to consider putting your chart up for a reading for the group because that's a really interesting placement. Um, okay. I'd start by questioning, asking you questions on how that's expressing in your life, because there's a lot going on in there. There's, there's self undoing, there's uh, institutionalization, there's uh, incarceration, there's limitation, there's death, there's, um, there's hidden enemies. Uh, they we're looking at the negatives when we do this, but the 12th house of all the houses is probably the one where you really want to talk to your client the most. Um, a to get an understanding and b to tread lightly especially if it's really really powerful um so um and every once in a while too you meet a client where they it's the full energy of it's expressing but they're not even aware how they're sabotaging themselves or things like that too so um they've got jupiter and gemini in uh, uh, aquarius that that could be anything from it ex excessive detachment uh and that would play well in the 12th house of somebody who um who isolates self isolates mm -hmm. or is trapped in their own mental thought forms or um trapped in study or um prejudice it could be intellectual prejudice and it may drive mm -hmm. people away it may make life harder and smaller for them um these are just i mean these are just ones i'm throwing off off the top of my head and um the, the worst part about it if it is as close to the ascendant as you make it sound then 
you may not be aware of it, but your your persona you're presenting to everybody else might be bro broadcasting those messages to the world around you. They may be seeing that and thinking, okay, wow, that's a person who's um, wired this particular way. And it, you, you know what I mean? It may mm -hmm. subconsciously be sending signals out to other people uh, that you may not be aware of. Um, and I think we've established with Aquarius, awareness is quite often a problem. Mm -hmm. so. I don't know if, uh, how I'm doing there, um, but J Jupiter um, will will amp that up, um, and will I guess make it difficult to hide, too, especially if, from the ascendant point of view. Uh, people will see it, uh, and it'll be difficult to you know you know what I'm talking about. Um, so um, based on mm -hmm. a lot of what we said before, it may be excessive in that regard. How does that sound? Does it at least give some a bit of direction or? I was primarily confused because it's right there by the line, but it falls into the 12th house rather than falling into the first house where I expected it. What happens when you look at it in um, equal and um, Placidus? Does it move? Which one is it? Uh, equal house and Placidus, the two different house systems. Does it move? I have to check. To I would say Placidus. Yeah. Okay. Well, check equal. Sometimes sometimes when, when I see something that close to... Uh, the cusp, uh, I'll check out both house systems uh, and talk to and present both to the client after I've asked a bunch of questions or qualifying questions about that planet. So if a planet's got moving from the 12th house and the first house, we got a whole different uh, type of energy for both. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask some questions about how that planet's expressing. And that may give me an idea of which which house system to use. Me, I like um, Placidus for a personality reading, but if mm -hmm. a situation like that where the person's own personality may not be as strong as what they're broadcasting to the rest of the world and what the rest of the world's seeing, and that's interfering with their life, then uh, equal would be an excellent go-to for that if it's putting that um, planet in the first house. I think one of okay, the early charts right. we had, we did that. Um, yeah, we had both, and I think we had the, the Placidus chart up in the study group, but then when I looked at it, uh, I thought, yeah, no, we're gonna do this in equal. Um, so we did that. It's funny, Ro Rowan. Can I just yeah. say something? It's funny if you have the ruler, your chart ruler is in the 12th house. No. No, no. What's your just Sun sign. You have Jupiter, Jupiter in the 12th house? Have you been in the 12th Aquarius. house? Yeah. But it's not the ruler of the ascendant? No. No. It oh, is. Okay. All right. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. But if you really want to explore it, like I said, you know, uh, welcome to um, put your chart up for a chart reading group as well. Uh, talk to Michael and about it. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. No worries. Wow. Does anybody else have anything they want to add or talk about? Oh, right, cool. I think I went dream tonight. I don't know why. Everything is so big. <laughs> yeah, that was great. That was wonderful. Yes. That was a lot of fun. I love oh, it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my mouth is dry. <laughs> <laughs> that was huge. That's just. Uh. Huge. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. It was such, you know what, for some reason, I, I thought Jupiter was going to be quite underwhelming based on what you said, uh, Antoinette, because it, it's energy. Even Donald Trump said this once, he said, take care of the downside because the upside looks after itself. You know what I mean? Uh, and Jupiter's the upside. Uh, you know what I mean? You don't have to stress about that sort of stuff. So I just thought, oh, you know, this is going to be a walk in the park. We're going to get through uh, and then we'll get to the end. It was just like ticking a box, but this has probably been the most fun of the uh, chart reading yeah. room so far, I think. So. Yeah, I mean, I got I put on lipstick, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, looked, it looked gorgeous. It, it started with the lipstick, and then it just took on a life of its own after that too. Yes. I was almost tempted to get my own Antoinette. So um... <laughs> you wear lipstick next time, Damien. <laughs> well, I got Jupiter Square Venus, so it's hard. Oh, okay, it's hard. okay. At least you're working with it. You're working with it. Yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> so, in rich girl, poor girl. Oh. <laughs> I wrote it down because I thought it was funny. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
Dan van haar Jupiter kan Jack Venus is the only. <laughs> What's really fun this evening? <laughs> good, good. Well, just, just before I forget too, um, Jana, before I stop recording, um, Michael and said you wanted to mention your ebook um, as well. Did um, you want to? Did you want to put that out there for the group as well? I've sent my email address through yesterday, so I haven't checked if I've got a link yet. Um, yeah, I, I posted it in the Facebook group, so I won't dive too much into it, but it's in the Facebook group. And, was um, yeah, that was, I was scrolling and I read it, but I didn't know, I didn't see who posted it. Okay. All right. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, I would love feedback if you read through it and, um, I haven't looked to see like who was able to access it yet, but um, I did write it for rising signs, obviously. And there's also affirmations in there for each rising sign related to the themes of Jupiter and Gemini. And um, I think I did mention for a number of signs, I remember writing um, about like being cautious of the excessiveness because of Gemini's kind of chaotic energy. So um like that definitely was something that like kept coming up for me. So yeah, I would love feedback because we're all fellow astrologers and just hopefully you guys enjoy it. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. All right. Thank I've, you. I've read it already and it's awesome. Thank you. It was a lot of, it's, uh -huh. it's beautifully presented and the, the content is easy to read as well. So great work. Thank you. Remind me your rising sign. I'm um, Gemini rising. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> also, That's great. Like Antoinette said, being careful this year. I don't think I'm capable of being careful. <laughs> <laughs> we're reckless here. <laughs> hang out with me sandra we'll get you really careful <laughs> no, i got a lot of mutable it's signs man i am the leading mutable sign person <laughs> <laughs> i'm leading who could be 13 come on let me see you try let me see you try come on come on come on, come on. 13 it was 18 that is 13. oh uh, i that, undersold myself by five. Oh, that's that's <laughs> lethal on a geiger counter <laughs> So um, that's Chernobyl level uh, mutable. So. <laughs> well, lately I have felt like John Wick. I tell you, I'm getting like curveballs left and right. I keep telling her, I'm like, I'm not John Wick. Like, what do they think I am? I got nine lives. I mean, good. Yeah, you don't want to know. But still, like, she, she saw me. You know, you should have been on the last one with about Mars. And I'm like, yeah, I probably should have. Wish I would have learned to, you know, sooner or later. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get you careful. Mm. Hang out with Perkos. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you for today. I'm going to stop recording, but um, um, we'll just keep the chat open. If anybody's got anything they'd like to say or talk or chat or anything like that, thanks for today. Uh, and I'll get this up on YouTube in the next uh, couple of days. Thanks for um, being Great. a part of this, everybody. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much.